so much, everybody, for joining us. This is, we're going to let a few people in here, too. All right. Good afternoon here on the East Coast, everybody. This is Dr. Tom Moorcroft coming to you again from the Get Well Show. Uh, we're doing our Leave Line Behind series. Uh, as you can see up here, we are on talk number six. Uh, and, and we talked this morning um, about pandas and pens and, you know, some challenges that our kids may be facing. But this afternoon, what we wanted to do is I wanted to get together with my um, daughter Talia here and teach you guys a little bit about the healing practices that we find are helpful for, um, you know, kids and adults. Let's see, just letting a few other people in the room here uh, so we could do the, the Zoom. So today, like I said, healing practices for children. And this is Talia. Hello. And let me now, whoops, jump in the gun there. So um, the thing about our healing practices is that we can actually use these um, for ourselves uh, as well as for our children. And what we wanted to do is really just talk about this because sometimes it's challenging, right? A lot of people are like, hey, what am I going to do with my kids? How can I get them excited about, you know, healing practices that actually work and make us resilient against Lyme and co-infections, pans and pandas, as well as COVID, uh, and just learn uh, how to deal with life and the stressors that uh, may come up. So I figured there's no better way to do it than to actually model the behaviors. You know, my whole life I've always been like, let's model the behaviors we want to see in other people and lead by example. And so that's what I figured we would do today. We would just get a child <laughs> who will be 11 tomorrow. Uh, so happy birthday, honey. And we, we're going to have, we're going to just model for you some of the things that we do in our home that we found helpful. Talk about a few other things. And, you know, again, I think, a lot of us are going to be really surprised what our kids will do if we just allow them the space to do it. And so I'm going to share with you today a few of the things that I really like and I think are really helpful for healing, especially in teaching our kids. But there's a bunch of things we're going to talk about that Talia made up on her own or came up with through like a YouTube search or whatever. And I found that I learned a ton from her. And uh, so we're going to dive right in. One of the things I think is super important um, is to chill out, right? I mean, it's like maybe one of the uh, most underrated things because we always keep running. So Talia, um, tell me about how do you remain mindful and what are the things that you like? Um, I like using these things that, um, well, I learned at school. They're called mindfulness jars. Basically, you shake it and then you just sit it on whatever you want to put it on and then stare at it and then basically you can watch watch the glitter fall Let's see if we can get the glitter up there so how so this is kind of cool because you see the glitter is in the bottom and then i can go Rah! and that's super cool and i know you have this one so what how how did you come up with this um um, one, well, one of my old teachers left the school and then she came back and she started like a yoga class and a mindfulness thing. Mm -hmm. And then she taught us yoga and stuff. And then she taught us how to make mindfulness jars. Well, she gave us paper to do it, but <laughs> scooch over here and turn up your microphone a little bit. There you go. Okay. So um, you, your teacher came back and taught you a little bit about in, in your yoga class about this. Look at this one. And basically, how you make it is you put, it's mostly water. Water. And then glue. Glue. A little glue. And Gotta then, have glue. <laughs> otherwise, it will just like fall and it won't be cool. But okay. Glue and then glitter. And glitter. Or so, whatever you want to put in it. <laughs> so this is water. This is, and this is just kind of like clear Elmer's glue type of thing. Yeah. Or you can put color, colored Elmer's glue. Colored glue. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. If you don't want it. And so what do I do? I, now, how do I relax now that you I've made stare, this? You stare at the glitter and watch it fall. It's pretty sweet. I love it. And we actually have a bunch of these all over the place. And um, we were actually out for the first of like four birthday dinners or so that we had with Talia last night. And a, we ran into a waiter that we had a couple of years ago. 
at a totally different a year ago at a different restaurant that was closing we knew where he was going but he was so good for talia that she actually gave him one of these and he still has it on his uh in his on his little like nightstand eat or, or chest or, or something his daughter's oh yeah it was in his daughter's room yeah oh, okay Cool. So mindfulness jars are a great way. And so this is not only like a way that you can help with relaxation and calming down, but like Talia taught me how to make these and she makes them and gives them to other people. So it's a really cool project that we can do together. Um, and then the other day, Talia came up with this amazing thing to help relaxation, especially at sleep time, but also just kind of anytime you need to relax. Can you tell us about these? So they're like, Lavender pillows, basically. I I just put like lavender in it and some stuffy stuff um, stuffing. Oh my god. Stuff. Yeah. And then um, I hot glued it because I couldn't find a small needle, so I hot glued them together and then yeah. And then and I got the bigger up. one that that's, <laughs> that's the one I so stick with. <laughs> Yeah, so this Talia sleeps with, and we notice that uh, she slept a little bit longer now that she has one of these. But so you you just have a, the, like a stuffing. Yeah. So it's just lavender. the material stuffing, and then you put actual lavender in here. And some and and then for some of them, a lavender essential oil if it doesn't smell good enough. Ooh, yeah, a little extra lavender essential oil if we need it stronger. Mm -hmm. And then we hot glue the edges around, and I mean, because you made mine in what like five minutes. Yeah. And she, it's like Talia got down to it and she just went and started making, you know, a ton of these. And I know that you have a bunch of gifts to give people now that are these. So again, th this is like a really cool little project that it's fun to do. It's something that's not TV. It's not something that is, you know, on the tablet. Now we use the tablet to do some research, especially yeah. for the mindfulness jar. But then, but then we moved away from it. So that's how, part of the way that we can combine two things, using the technology for research as well as entertainment. Because, I mean, watching people make these things or making one of these yeah. mm, is so good. So that's really good. Thanks for grabbing that. You're so one of the other things that we do is a while back we started talking about this, which is gratitude. And there's a thing called a five-minute journal um, that we can use for adults. And um, that's very helpful. And there's also a kid's version. And so basically the idea is in the morning and the evening, uh, we write down some, uh, some things we're grateful for so that we can bring them into our conscious awareness. Now, the thing was, if you look in my book, I used it for a while and then it started to go blank. And I actually started journaling in, um, they're over here on the floor over there, but um, and I have some bigger journals that I write in a lot. But then like with Talia, she's got the cool polka dotted kids one and we used it for a while. But then after after that, we kind of shifted over to, you know, we didn't stay just in the journal. It's a little too strict for us. So what we did is we, we moved it and we talk about it like in the morning or in the evening or dinner time or even in the car or, or bedtime. We're just something that we're grateful for. What are you grateful for today? Um, my family. Your family? Aw, me too. I'm grateful that it is Talia's birthday this weekend, so we're having a fun celebration. She's getting to spend some time with some friends. We're getting to have some family over, um, and we're going to have a really good time with that. So again, it's like just a little bit of gratitude. As we talked in Relax and Rabu and in a couple of the other talks we did, you know, this idea of gratitude can help bring um, a heart-centered awareness into our life bring possibility into our lives, but also improve heart rate variability. So when we're doing a little breathing while we're talking about our gratitude and calming ourselves down, these are things that will actually allow immune system function to be bumped up and also to just calm down the nervous system. So one of the things that we can do, and I was just showing Talia this one, because we do, we've done all kinds of yoga and breathing and Sometimes we even do Wim Hof meditations together and we're laying on the floor and he's going like, ah, la, 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 because he's crazy. Like if you get into his programs, it's a, he gets even nuttier than he's on YouTube, right? <laughs> so one of the things that we wanted to show you and then I talked about um, with a lot of my groups is just a simple alternate nostril breathing. 
this is a, a way to help your kids learn something that will balance the fight or flight and the rest and rejuvenate side of the autonomic nervous system. So we call them sympath sympathetic and the parasympathetic, and we want them in balance. So the idea will be is that we're going to breathe in one nostril, then we're going to close that one and open the other, and we're going to breathe out the other, and then in that and that. So basically, we'll start on the right, and we're going to do something kind of like this, and I'll walk tell you through it in just a minute. But as I share, we're going to hold our fingers up to our nose. I'm, there we go. And I'm going to inhale through the right. I'm going to change to the left. Exhale left. And I'm going to inhale left, and then... Exhale right, and I'm going to continue to kind of do this in on the right, hold out through the left, and back and forth. And maybe we'll do how we we try a few. We'll do three seconds each way. So let's close the left nostril, and there you go. And then inhale for one, two, three, switch. Exhale two, three. Inhale same side two, three. Exhale the other side. There you go. One more. Inhale for three. Oop, inhale on the same side. There you go. Hold it, and the other way, out on the left, <laughs> and then inhale. <laughs> and the thing is, is none of this stuff we're talking about has to be perfect, whether I'm modeling it, we're playing with our breathing. Have fun, right? I mean, this is one of the most important pieces is to put a smile on our face because then we know we're getting into our heart, and that's really the part that is the most grounding. When we, we talk about polyvagal theory, we, we'll get like, you really all like that, huh? <laughs> Polyvagal theory. We're going to do a report on that for school next week. Um, the thing about it is we know that the parasympathetic side of the nervous system actually has multiple branches now. And one of the most important branches goes down to the gut, but the other goes to the heart. And they actually kind of work differently. So we want to match them together. So you know, while we, we can play with the alternate nostril breathing, we can play with slowing our breathing down in other ways. But the beauty of the whole thing that we can do with, is we got we both smiled a lot and we just like have pure joy. And that's the thing that can really, um, that's what we're learning will get us back into that. Because part of the parasympathetic nervous system, which we usually talk about rest, rejuvenation, digest, immune system function, Unfortunately, part of that, the, the more reptilian or older part, can actually get us into a stuck, numb, hopeless state. And that's the place that we want to move. That's where we get from that really gut-dominant, sub-diaphragmatic area. So we want to move it back into the heart. So anything we can do that can make us smile and have a good time. So those are some fun things that we do, uh, amongst all the other crazy things. <laughs> so can you tell me about Mary Morrissey a little bit? Um. Like, what about her? I don't know. Who is she? She is a, um, mind, I guess, life-ish coach person. Yeah, she's kind of like a mindset life coach, yeah. And a dream builder. And, um, super nice woman. Mm-hmm. What did she teach you? She taught, um, I hope a lot of other people, too, but, <laughs> um, that... Like, I'm trying to think of a word here, but like, um, if you dream, anything that you dream can come true. Like, say if I wanted a, um, I don't know, a horse. <laughs> And I dreamt about it for a while, and I did the work to get it. Then it would, it would happen. Mm -hmm. It would happen. So if you dream about it, and you do, you the, do and, the work, and don't give up, because if you give up, then it's not gonna happen. <laughs> so what are some of the work that you can do to help you get to your dream? Like, I. I think it's helpful to tell other people about your dreams mm -hmm. who actually tell people who will actually believe in you. Like I, I told my friends and they're like, no, they're just like, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> right. If you're not used to dreaming, yeah. it seems weird to you. Yeah. And so I tell them about it and they, my parents and they, <clears throat> excuse me, believe me. And they helped me, like, 
they help me do like what I what my dream is and like so how did you find out about your dream or what dreams do you have do you have any examples you could show us Oh, your earring fell out. We did have this dream of getting a second hole in our ears, but COVID and Connecticut state law changed that. We have two more years before we can do that. This is my video work for Here, let me hold it so that they can hear you, so that you can talk into the mic, too. So it's my video work for 2020, which is going to change to 2021. And um, so one of my dreams is also to live in Utah, and so is my parents because it's Beautiful. Living in the East Coast is not fun because skiing is just skiing on a piece of ice. And we want to ski more, right? On oh, that. Some. Yay. Ah, Ty know. wants to ski there. <laughs> and I also wanted like a tree house in my backyard, which is down here. Every, all the papers started to crinkle. I don't know why. Um, that. Does it still work as a vision board? Even uh, though it's yeah. crinkly? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, so like sometimes you could glue them and it'll hold more, but Talia put them on with brass tacks and little mini nails. But, you know, <laughs> the idea being is this ha it's, it, it just has to be what you want and it stimulates your thinking. And so let your kids have fun making this. Which one's this? I don't know. It's I a garden. Oh, that's a garden. I want a garden like eh, there that, it, oh, that, yeah. and this tiny thing down there. Right? There and I, it looks like we're getting another Malinois puppy when our older dogs go. And, and, and a, a pit, pit bull, bull puppy. They're so sweet. Most people don't know that. They just yeah. think they hear the bad thing. But the pu they're, they're so nice. Eh. Most of them. And then I love this. This is beautiful. This is kind of like I want to be in touch with nature and have love and everything. Yeah. Awesome. So this is an example of a vision board, and I've seen adults use these. Uh, I've seen kids use these, and the idea is, it, um, I don't, I can't figure out holding this which way to go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it doesn't matter, you know, whether it looks perfect. When this is first done, obviously everything was laying down, but Talia is gonna, uh, you know, change it around and improve it a little bit. And it can always be, you know, modified and changed. But the idea is it's, it brings up emotion, you know, like the beautiful garden and the tree house and the doggies and the hearts and the skiing. So that's also one of the reasons why I didn't use um, glue. So I can just like take them out whenever I need Change it when you need to? Yeah, this one's like falling out. <laughs> What's that one? It's a garden. As well. Oh, that's another garden? Well, we're going to have a lot of gardens here. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, but it's, it's, it's really beautiful. And even if you notice, like even the house that Talia likes... It's got a lot of nature in it and openness and, and outdoors and being connected. And that's something that's meaningful to her. And so the beauty of the vision board and for any of us, for, you know, adults or our kids, is we put down what we really want, you know, and maybe Talia puts down something that I don't quite want right now, but that's okay because that's part of her dream and she may get it sooner or later. But the idea is we, we want to, in our society, I think we've gone so far away from dreaming and really thinking about, hey, what would I really love in life? And we just go, no, this is what I should have or I could have. The vision board is about what you would really, truly love and what you'd really want. So do you think this would work for your health? Yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and now we actually have a house that we're eyeing on in Utah, so that one I'm going to change. Yeah, there you go. And that's the thing. You can get something close to what you want. And as you get closer, you can fine tune it. And I would highly recommend for anybody with a health challenge um, to really be focusing on putting things up there that to you identify with optimal health. So that could be pictures of people who are healthy doing the things you want to do. But the other part could be something like this, where you're actually putting the places you're going to go when you're better and doing the things you're going to do. And maybe... It's not that you want to go skiing psycho places like Talia, Jill, and I want to do, but maybe what you want to do is you have really bad knees from Lyme, say, and you have some hip pain and you have a hard time getting up and down off the ground, but you want to be able to get up and down off the ground really fluidly because you want to play with your grandkids because who nobody wants to be healthy, right? I've never met anybody who truly wants to be healthy. They want to be healthy for a reason, right? They don't want money. They want money so they can buy Talia's house there. So they can have the experience. So they most want the benefits of it. Yes, exactly. And so the idea here is what we want to do on our vision boards and, and in our dreams is to put down the things that emotionally get us going, the things that we're going to do when we're healthier. Because the thing is, 
you can't go skiing in an extreme place or you can't go down on the ground play or and jumping up and down and swinging your grandkids or your kids or whatever you're doing if you're not healthy. So we have to, uh, we, we kind of create a vision of the things we love to do, assuming the things that we need to do, that we need in order to do those. So for us to go skiing here, as an example, because I love that, we need health. We need a lot of health and some working out. But like Talia said, you, you dream it and then you do the work. So we, we exercise to be able to do that and such, and we eat in such a way that we could do that, as an example. All right, cool. So... There you go. One of the other things that I wanted to talk about, I think is really important, is, is, is exposing our kids to things that stimulate conversation. And so right here is a thing that Tally actually introduced me to. Um, I watched it on a plane ride. Yeah, you watched it on a plane ride. Yeah. To Hawaii. To, was it to Hawaii? Yeah, because on the way home you watched the scary one yeah. that I didn't know you were watching. <laughs> so yeah. the thing is... Tell us a little bit about the, the, the Biggest Little Farm movie here. So it's kind of about, so these, this couple, they were living in a really small apartment, and they, so, oh, That's thank okay. you. Uh, you're welcome. And so. Uh, small apartment uh, couple. Small apartment, and they, and the, the wife want, um, was like a very, big like health person she she had like a food blog right food blog or something like that and they they and then so she was doing that and then one day they went to this woman who had a bunch of dogs like 100 dogs in her house and a lot of them were going to be put down and stuff because the authorities were going to take them away from her and then they just saw this this really really cute dog it was um i don't know what it was but yeah, it was like a it was a mix and it was a all black dog and then it had these bright like turquoise eyes and they were amazing and so and they named it todd and so they went back to the apartment and every time they would leave for their work he would just start barking and yep. not stop and then they got them all these things and the funny thing that i really remember is they got him like a vesty thingy that was supposedly oh an anxiety like, yeah like yeah, the thunderstorm exactly. anxiety vest yeah and then, and then he tore up the carpet <laughs> <laughs> yeah that worked really well <laughs> and then so then when they got a call from their um, landlord yep landlord, landlord was kicking them out yeah they were kicking us out so and so all along the wife wanted like a farm where everything worked in harmony like the old ways not like the new farming ways where basically everything was underneath plastic stuff and like that right yeah so do you remember the part so they wanted a farm they, yeah, a, they wanted a farm and they wanted to do it in a different way so do you remember what happened at the party with their friends where they told them so they told them and they all made fun of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy. So they, everybody, they shared their dream, and then they all thought they were nuts. Yeah, and then one person told another person, and then that person told a whole bunch of other people, and then on and on and on. And then they found an investor. So what I think is really cool is that it sounds like they told everybody their dream. Initially, everybody thought they were nuts, but then when they realized how passionate they were and how these people were making actions in that direction um, every day, then they were like, oh, they're serious oh, wow, this is actually possible. And then next thing you know, by having all those conversations, they got investors. Now, Talia, I don't think I even showed you this yet, but um, I pulled this up earlier today. I love this picture because I went to school for natural resources and, and um, wildlife management, landscape, ecology. And so when you see this, what is, this is from, the, from the, the farm. What does this like look like or mean to you? It looks like a bunch of different plants and trees and stuff. And all, it looks like a farm. It looks like a farm. Does it look like the regular farms? Yeah. No. What What was different? What did they teach us in the movie? Do you remember? That, um, they, what I remember is that, so the husband was, like, trying to fix all these problems because, like, there was, like, I never knew this, but apparently, um, snails? Yes. Yeah, yeah, snails. Snails love to eat fruit leaves and stuff, and they were destroying the trees like completely and there was like over like there was like a million of them like literally and so he's like oh my god what am i gonna do and then he saw his dog 
And then the dog was just staring at everything, just like closely and stuff. So he started to do that, and then he saw it. They had ducks, and the ducks love to eat snails, so they let them out and stuff. So base, and then another problem happened, and then they also leave behind their feces poop. Yep. poop. <laughs> and that helps the soil. Yeah. And then um, more problems kept coming up, and then they would just take a step back, and then see what could fix it and it would all and it wouldn't be like putting pesticides or something down mm -hmm. and then they had another problem with coyotes i think just killing all their chickens and everything mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so then i think they just tried to stop them from getting in and stuff right and then they um I, don't, I think they talked about it later on in the movie, and then, and then they had a problem with like they got the dog in there though, right? Yeah, the, like one dog ate the chickens, but the other yeah. one liked them, <laughs> so they found one dog that liked them and then lived with them. Yeah, and then like supposedly scared off the coyotes and stuff. Right. And then they had a gopher problem and stuff, and so they put a barn owl thingy up, and then. And then they thought, oh, coyotes, like, and wolves and stuff, well, like, eat those things. So then they they let the coyotes only come into the, like, pastures and stuff. And then they just, like, it dropped dramatically and stuff. Yeah. So I think one of the things I that I learned from this is uh, balance. Yeah. It is about finding a balance of all. It's not about doing one only one thing. And then they had a part where... There was a big flash flood, uh, a big rainstorm, but all the other farms had all cracked. All their soils washed out. Yep. But there, since they had cover crops and stuff like that, they were able to keep the water. Yeah, and they stored like over like a like I don't know, so a lot of water. It was like yeah, they, it was the like number a, was insane. It was, it was like a billion. <laughs> so the thing is, part of it was balance that they found. They found balance in in what their farm had at different times. And then they also, I think what Talia said was really important, is they stepped back and they looked. And, and when there was a problem or a concern, a challenge that came up, what the guy did was, he's just like, hey, I'm going to step, I look to those around me to support me. Oh, my dog. And my dog is just taking it in. And rather than making a, a snap judgment, the dog stepped back and just said, hmm. And so then, this, you know, so Todd was teaching his owners to just, step back and look. And as they did that, they started to see new possibilities. So a lot of times we have a goal and we think we know how to get there, but be open, you have, yeah, be open to some other way of getting there because they all knew that they could get rid of the coyotes if they shot them, but they didn't want to shoot the coyotes. And then they're like, oh, now we're having all these other problems. But ultimately when they found the right balance, the coyotes were able to be there as part of the ecosystem, and they were able to solve not only that problem, but more by using the wisdom of the universe and, na and the natural world around them. What was the thing, though, well, another piece I think is really important to teach our kids and to, for all of us adults, too, is do you remember the guy, uh, the, their mentor? How yeah. long did he say that it would take for the farm to go from crappy, barren soil to a full Seven years. So sometimes it happens really quickly, but sometimes when you start doing the mindfulness, when you start doing the alternate nostril breathing, the vision boarding, it takes a longer period of time. So the seed is going to grow on its own, but what we, and so our job is to plant the seed, the growth potential is already in there. We want to plant that seed. And right? nurture it. Yep, so we're going to water it and give it the right food, and we're going to pull out the weeds. So there will be times where you have a bad day. Like we were having a conversation earlier. We had a little you know, hiccup in the middle of our day, but we sit down and we pull out the weeds. So when it's going well, let's celebrate it. Let's have gratitude. Let's love it. But when it's not going as well as we want, let's address it, and the, let's not continue to chronically think about it. Let's take that weed and get rid of it. And that's exactly what we learn here. So that's a lot of what we like to do. We like to sit down, and if we're going to do something entertaining, let's find something that's motivational, that Talia loves, and let's have a conversation. And we talk about this movie on and off for sometimes a lot, and then we won't talk about it for a while. But then we get down, and we sit down, and we have conversations in front of other people like all of you, and sometimes we just have them on our own about what we've learned about this. 
And I think that like mindfulness and, and promoting health has become this like, I follow the protocol and I have to do this and that. But in the end, be fun. Have yeah. a good time. And another movie that I find interesting, or a couple of them, is like, it's called Seal Team 6 and 12 Strong. <laughs> and it is, I probably should be watching that, but oh well. Yeah, um, we are definitely <laughs> getting the uh, Best Parent of the w a Year award. But what about like Seal Team 6 and uh, 12 Strong did you find to be motivational? Well, it's because like people are like, I didn't know anything about, um, Bin Laden? No, 9-11. Oh, 9-11, yeah. 9-11. I didn't know anything about it. I just knew some place in New York got hit by a plane or something like that. <laughs> and, um, so after I started learning about it a little bit more and stuff, and then my parents were like, oh, let's watch this movie about... Right. about it i'm like sure <laughs> like i don't know what to expect and i found it really interesting because people are willing to go out there and like risk their lives and also like the people who did it they it's like you ha they have to take off everything that like shows who they are like and that's why they have like nicknames and stuff because mm -hmm. they will like go and kill your entire family after, after you die right and so, like, it's not only you, like, going out there and willing to, like, sacrifice your life, but sacrificing, like, your own family's life. Right. And it's crazy. And I just think it's so interesting about, like, I, I don't know, it's just really interesting. Well, Talia's a bit of a history buff, too, and loves World War II things, so there's a little bit of a backstory yeah. between, we don't just jump into, like, watching, like, 12 Strong with a 10-year-old. Um, we are certainly up there in, in the running for people who, uh, who push the envelope a little bit. But it was coming up in conversation. And one of the things I think that really came out of it for me is, like what you just said, they had a strong belief that they, and they put everything on the line for it. And whether they're on the team that you believe in or, did, or was doing right or wrong, you know, the, everybody on both sides were doing what they believed was, was correct. Correct. And so one of the things I would say is like, we can learn a lot historically that way. But when we look at what we do, if you look at the sacrifices people are willing to make to achieve their dream or to do what they believe is best, if you put health in your family and love and optimal health and wellness as your priorities and you make those your dream, you create a burning desire and you're going to get there. Right. And the other thing that's really interesting in, in, in 12 Strong is they did something that was completely unexpected. And they said, look, if we wait six weeks, it's going to be all over for the whole winter. We need to do this six to 12 week mission in three weeks or it's not going to work. And everybody was like, that's not possible. And the guy's like, that's the only way to get it done. And then the commander was like, well, you guys are going in because you're the only person who actually understands that this is important and it needs to get done quickly. So the things that are most important in your life make a priority and get it done. Don't wait. So there's a lot of interesting ways where we can play off this. And now we've had very in-depth conversations about uh, terrorism and diversity and history uh, through all of these things. Because Talia loved, there's, she's very into some of these historical movies. And, and, and one of the other movies that I love to watch is, well, one is, never mind, I forget the name of it. It's like Dumb City or something. I, I don't remember. I never, like the. Dumb oh, City. <laughs> I, I In saying, Alabama? Of oh, oh, Selma. Yeah, Selma. <laughs> I was thinking. I was thinking you were gonna say either Harriet or Just Mercy. Oh yeah, I was gonna say both of those, but yeah. right. Selma is. It was about um, Martin Luther King Jr. and um, I didn't. I before these movies, I didn't know anything about any of these movies. Honestly, uh, anything about them and stuff, except for maybe the Harriet. I knew some Harriet Tubman. Yeah. yeah. I knew about that, but, like, I didn't know about Martin Luther King Jr. and stuff. And that movie, like, my entire family was crying at the end. Right. It's a lot. It's really interesting. When you look at these and you watch these together, you learn about Martin Luther King, what he stood for, Harriet Tubman, what she, she stood for. And then you look at, like, Just Mercy and... Um, 
how everybody comes together to do what they believe is the right thing, right? And what was cool about Just Mercy is they even were like, they started working with not only just pe black people on death row who were, who were put there everybody. theoretically unjustly, yeah, but white people and everybody else. It didn't matter. They were doing just what... For some reason, Siri thinks it's important to talk to us right now, <laughs> even though I thought I told her to not disturb us. But the thing is, you can take these movies and you can take everyday experiences and look at them and learn about dreaming, right? And so right now, Tally and I are talking about how these people had a dream that was not health related. And they look at this and they really, that's what they made their burning desire, their sole purpose. And they were able to slowly, surely achieve that. And some of it happened really quickly, and some of it was a long play. It was a long game. But, you know, the thing is, as we learn together, your health can be part of your dream, too. So we don't necessarily have to shove health down our throats. We can say, hey, let's learn about dreaming through this thing. I mean, you can think about even, like, what is it? Um, uh, I want to say Thunderball. I don't know if it's the right term. But there, there was a dodgeball movie where all the guys who had been injured and they are paraplegics and they're in wheelchairs playing dodgeball. And they were just, I want to get out there and be super competitive. And I remember years and years and years ago, right after that uh, movie came out, I met one of the guys in the airport. And you're just like, here's a guy who lost his legs. And his dream was to get out there and do competitive sports. And he made it happen. And in the process of getting back to that, Mentally, he totally shifted. Emotionally, he totally shifted. And uh, the, the um, autofocus is freaking out because <laughs> you and I are bouncing back and forth. Getting... But the other thing was he physically changed. So he optimized his immune system, body, mind, and spirit all the time just because he had this other dream that appear on the outward side didn't necessarily have much to do with his health. It was just like, I want to go do something. So when you get this burning desire, we can teach our kids and have fun and have a conversation about really good things and learn a lot, but we can take it and then we can teach the principle that we will later on apply maybe directly to health. So these are some of the really important things. And I just, before I hop over here, I just um, want to say thank you so much for joining me. I know we could do this a million times and for forever, but I think this is a good stopping point for tonight. Are there? Yeah. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, and then I'll let you have the last word if you want, is this is a picture from a while ago, as you can tell, because Talia is really young and I don't have a beard. Mommy looks like exactly the I same. I know. She looks the same. <laughs> and she wears the same thing, too. I know. It's funny. Well, hey, when you have a, a look that's, that's working for you and you're beautiful, like, just let it be. But so... <laughs> I think, you know, this, um, to me, this is just sums it up. We need, it. let's have fun, right? Let's make this health thing a lot of fun. Let's like learning together as a family have, you know, we're going to have struggles, but let's go back and have a good time with it. So for anybody who's um, looking, I think I missed the slide here. But anyway, if you're looking to learn more about this and how I apply this specifically to Lyme and healing from chronic illnesses, definitely go check out Leave Lyme Behind. That program launches in January. I have a quick start guide that everybody who grabs that now will get immediately. And we have a bunch of cool things going on in December. And let's see. So uh, the last bit for today is this is our healing practices for kids and adults. Let's have a good time with it and have some fun. Tomorrow, uh, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be talking how to pandemic proof ourselves and how to apply very specific self-healing principles, some, some herbs, nutrients, uh, other techniques um, uh, to COVID resilience. And we'll talk a little bit more about COVID uh, all throughout the day. And what you're going to find is that a lot of the principles that we talked about today just now and all of the healing principles behind chronic Lyme and other things, they overlap quite a bit with COVID. And this is a place where we can develop not only current resilience in this winter time as everything's starting to spike for this third wave or 27th wave whatever we're on right we're got, we, we have the ability to create a lifelong habit that's going to lead to health so the things we do right now maybe right now our motivation is covid but then it applies to lyme and our and then our entire life so enjoy that uh join us for that piece any last parting words that you can think of where we're talking about healing techniques and mindfulness techniques we can use with kids and their parents have a great time with everything nice all right thank you talia thank you thank you happy birthday again thank you and thank you everybody for joining us this is a blast uh we'll be back doing lots of these again again for the get well show definitely if you're there stop by the booth uh everyone else just catch us um at those times i'll flash them one more time just in case 
uh, tomorrow, 12 p.m. Eastern time, and then 3 p.m. will be um, our discussion of how to apply that. So the first one would be more principles. We're going to go through some specifics, like, like I said, with some some dosages and some techniques to get those in. And then down here, 3 p.m. is really going to be bringing the entire weekend together, how to heal Lyme and COVID and supercharge that at home. Hope everybody has an amazing rest of your Saturday or whatever day it is, wherever you are, because <laughs> it could be Sunday already for some of my friends. Right. And we'll see you next. What? Or it could be a different year. No, That's true. <laughs> you know, I'm getting close, right? In the, quant in the quantum plane, <laughs> it is every year. So thanks so much for having us, guys. We'll talk to you soon.